And now, Around the World, the Jack Benny Program. Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Bob Crosby, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, this broadcast is coming to you from New York City, where tonight Jack Benny will also do his television show with his special guest, Miss Helen Hayes. But right now, we're doing a radio show from the Lincoln Square Theater. We can't bring you Lincoln, but here's a real square, Jack Benny! <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, that was such a wonderful introduction you gave me. It's a shame it's your last one. <laughs> what do you mean, my last one? Well, Don, this show is transcribed, and the program and you will be released at the same time. <laughs> but, Jack... Look, I... Don, I'm only kidding. Oh, say, Jack, did you read that last week President Eisenhower played golf at the club you belong to in Palm Springs, Tamarisk? Yes, Don, and what a thrill I got when I read that. Just imagine the President of the United States driving off from the same tee that I drove off, putting on the same green that I putted on, tipping the same caddy that called me a cheapskate. <laughs> <laughs> what a thrill. You know, Jack, when the President plays golf, he's accompanied by 20 Secret Service men. 20 Secret Service men? Mm -hmm. Gosh, I bet he never loses the ball. <laughs> You know, FBI means fine ball instantly. <laughs> but anyway, Don, it's exciting being here in New York again, isn't it? Uh, it certainly is, Jack. And have you noticed all the changes since we were here last? You bet I have, Don. They've painted the sub-treasury building. Brinks has four new trucks. And there's a brand new carpet in the Chase National Bank. <laughs> anyway, Don, I'll... Excuse me, Don. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. Rochester, where are you? I'm backstage at the television studio. Oh, how's everything going? Fine, fine. I've been watching Miss Hayes rehearse on the set. Oh, yes, Helen Hayes. I'm sure lucky to get her as a guest star. She's some actress, isn't she, Rochester? Yeah, and boss, you should have seen her this afternoon. In one minute, she went from a mood of carefree, lighthearted gaiety to the pent-up emotions of anger, frustration, and despair. Gee, what scene was that? No scene. She was reading a contract. <laughs> hmm. Well, Rochester, she's probably nervous. Everybody gets excited before a live television show. On the contrary, boss. Everyone's very calm here. Your producer is taking a nap. The director is reading the magazine, and the writers are playing cards. In fact, we've had only one attack of nerves all afternoon. Really? Who had it? Your makeup man. <laughs> My makeup man? But Rochester, this makeup man in New York has never worked on me before. He's never even seen me. Did you describe me to him? Did you tell him that I'm only 39 years old? Uh-huh. I even went further than that. I told him you had skin like a peach. Well, good, good. What did he say? He asked me if I'd ever seen the skin on a 39-year-old peach. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> all right, all right. I'll talk to you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? I was just wondering if I could have tomorrow off. Tomorrow? But, Rochester, just last week you had three days off. Oh, boss, you're not going to count them, are you? Why not? We were on the train. Well, you had nothing to do. Nothing? Every time we came to a stop, you threw a white coat on my back, shoved a whisk broom in my hand, and we split the tips. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can have tomorrow off. I'll see you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. Was that Rochester? What did you say, Don? I say, was that Rochester? If it wasn't, I've been talking to a giraffe with a <laughs> sore throat. <laughs> Don! Once in a while, I slip one 
in, you know? <laughs> I'm an ad-libbing fool, you know? <laughs> Except I got it written in pencil. Yeah. I didn't tell anybody. You know? <laughs> Don, Rochester's over at the television studio watching a rehearsal. Oh, Jack, how did you manage to get such a wonderful actress like Helen Hayes to appear on your television show? Well, Don, I heard that she was very anxious to appear on an outstanding comedy program, so I went up to her apartment and asked her to be on my show, and she accepted immediately. Well, that's amazing. I will admit, of course, I used a little trick. What did you do? I had my leg in a cast. She thought I was Jackie Gleason. <laughs> you know, Don, sometimes you have to be very clever about how you... See who that is, will you, Don? Sure, Jack. Uh, can we speak to Mr. Bunny? Say, Jack, it's a fellow and four girls. They want to talk to you. To me? Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Bunny, my name is Rogers Ann Hammerstein. Rogers Ann Hammerstein? No, Rogers Ann Hammerstein. The N stands for Nathan. <laughs> oh. When you told me who you were, I was amazed. You know, you have a very famous name. Yeah, I know. Nathan sells hot dogs in Coney Island. <laughs> Oh, well, look, Mr. Hammerstein. Uh, just call me Nate. <laughs> well, what can I do for you, Nate? Well, myself and these four girls here are members of the Jack Benny fan club. I'm the president. Well, how... <laughs> how long have you people been my fans? Mr. Benny, we realized you was our kind of guy when we first saw you at the Palace Theater. Gosh. When was that? Yesterday evening when you was arguing with a cashier about changing the prices. <laughs> Oh, were you there? All the time, till the cops broke it up. <laughs> well, look, it's very nice of you to come over, but right now I'm doing a radio show. Yeah, that's why we came over. The girls want to welcome you to New York. Welcome me? Yeah, take it, girls. Hello, 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 hello there. Hello, beautiful. How'd you get so beautiful? Where'd you get those lovely big blue eyes? Where'd you get them all? Where'd you get them? You're, You're our lover boy. Oh, what a handsome cover boy. How do you stay young? Please put us wise. When you smile at us, we get ecstatic. But your fiddle should stay in the attic. Oh, hello, beautiful. You are all so cute. That was very good, girls. Very good. And Mr. Hammerstein... Uh, just call me Nate. Hmm. Well, Nate, I want you to know that I appreciate your bringing the girls over to sing to me. But tell me, what was that boing at the end? I wanted their goitles broke. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Come in. Hi, Jack. Well, Georgie Jessel... Georgie, what are you doing here? I'm looking for a kangaroo with a sore throat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I tell you why I'm here, Jack. <laughs> I get one in every once in a while. <laughs> Jack, I'm ashamed of myself. You know, you were good enough to MC the testimonial dinner that the Friars gave me the other night, and I didn't even get a chance to talk to you. That's all right, Georgie. You were busy. Well, I didn't feel right about it, so I thought I'd come over and say hello. Well, thanks, Georgie. That's nice of you. And as long as I'm here... <clears throat> I'd like to make this an occasion for welcoming you to this great and thriving metropolis. Georgie, no speeches now. I just got a few notes. Oh. Yes, my good people. <laughs> faith, hope, and charity, without which we would all be striving without point or purpose. George, I'm doing a program. And now. on behalf of the eight million residents of this community, we welcome you, Jack Benny, to the great city of New York. Is, uh, is that all? No, I'd like a glass of water now. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen such a guy. When other people meet, they shake hands. He delivers an address. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jack. That's all right. By the way, Georgia, this is my announcer, Don Wilson. Yes, of course. You know, Don, I've seen you at so many of the dinners in which I've been the Toastmaster. Oh, you have? Yeah, and if you'd look up from your plate once in a while, you'd see me, too. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I, George, I hear Jack made a very good MC at the dinner the Friars gave you. Darren Jack was just wonderful. He said so many nice things about me. Oh, uh, he did? Yes, he did. His speech was so beautiful. He paid me such flowing compliments. I sat there thinking, either he's lying or I'm dead. <laughs> I paid you a lot more compliments, many more. In fact, I had so much material left over that I plan to do a sketch tonight based on your life. Oh, no. This is your show, and the Friars have already honored me, so let's do a sketch that I've written about your life. But I'd rather do your life. No, no. This is a half-hour program, and the way I've lived, you'd never get mine in. Believe me, Jack. <laughs> well, if that's the way you feel, go ahead. Let's hear it. Now, this is a story about my life. Your life. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the Jack Benny story. Or you can't take it with you because he owns it. <laughs> and music. Our story begins with the birth of Jack Penny in the year 1894, 39 years ago. <laughs> Happened in the little town of Waukegan, Illinois. The proud parents gazed with delight on the blue-eyed baby. And it was at this moment that Jack Benny's voice was heard for the first time. <laughs> Look at him, Papa. He's so cute. Yes, we'll call him Jackie. Doctor, I want to ask you something. Oh, I know all parents think their children are unusual. But honestly, Doctor, isn't our Jackie different from most babies you've delivered? I can't tell. I, I'm also a veterinarian. <laughs> Jackie, Papa, he's got your mouth. And he's got your nose. And he's got your eyes. And he's got your ears. But look at his hair. Uh, that's mine. It slipped off. <laughs> there, there, Jackie. Quiet now. Now, uh, Mr. Benny, about my fee... Uh... Oh, don't worry, Doctor. Just mail your bill and my son, Jackie, will send you a check. Oh, thank you very... Well, now, wait a minute. Your son here, Jackie, he's, uh, he's only a few minutes old. How can he send me a check? And I don't know how he did it, but he's already saved $800. <laughs> and so the little baby began to grow and make rapid progress. At the age of six months, he astounded medical science because he had 32 teeth. All of it. Ah... Uh... <laughs> Ah, but Jack was a happy little child, and all day long, he used to sit in his crib playing with his toys. <laughs> and as he grew older, his parents gave him everything he wanted. But Jack wasn't an only child. He had a younger sister named Florence. Today, he has an older sister named Florence. <laughs> But the years passed, and finally, Jackie entered school. And as a student, he was exceptionally bright, in particular, in arithmetic. And now, for the next question, I will call on Jackie Benny. Yes, teacher. Now, Jackie, if you loaned $10 to Albert, and $5 to Irving, and $15 to Tommy, and they all paid you back at once, how much money would you have? $31. I'm sorry, Jackie, but the correct answer is only $30. What about the interest? <laughs> Oh, yes, I forgot. And that reminds me, Jackie, I'll pay you the money I owe you Friday. Good. <laughs> Good. Then I'll give you back your wristwatch. <laughs> it was easy to see that there was something about Jackie that was different from other boys. In his class, there was one little boy who lived near the stockyard. There was another whose home was above a livery stable. And still another who lived next door to a glue factory. Yet Jackie was the only kid in his class called Stinky. <laughs> He seemed to know that he was destined for a musical career. And for the next few years, he took violin lessons regularly. <laughs> no, no, no. How many times must I tell you smoothly, smoothly? I'm sorry. We'll play it again. Only this time, hold the bow with one hand. You are not Thai Cobb. <laughs> not today. The lesson she is over. Oh, well, goodbye, Professor. Wait, you did not pay me. Huh? Monsieur Benny, I want my money. Well, Jack was persistent about his violin playing, and he took lessons here. Monsieur Benny, my money. After year. Monsieur Benny, my money. After year. Please, Monsieur Benny, my money. <laughs> Finally came the day of his graduation from elementary school. It was a proud moment for Jack and his parents, for that was the day that he put on his first pair of long pants. He looked kind of bulky over his diapers. 
man. As he was preparing to leave the house, his parents looked at him proudly and they said, Jackie, we're proud of you. Thanks, Mother. I'm so excited. Look at him, Mama. Doesn't he look handsome? He should look handsome. He's got your mouth. And he's got your nose. And he's got your eyes. And he's still got my hair. <laughs> you'll get it. You'll get it. Let him graduate first. And we want to get there early. He's going to play a violin solo. teachers and fellow graduates. Your kind reception to my musical offering has filled my little heart with joy. But I don't deserve all this applause alone. Some of the glory must be shared by my music teacher. That wonderful man, that pretty and genius, that great... Never mind the compliments. I want my money. <laughs> Jack Benny's schooling and violin study were interrupted by World War I when he entered the armed forces. He was really too young to go, but his father was on the draft board. <laughs> In 1917, we find Jack no longer a boy, but a man, ready to enter the Navy. Goodbye, Papa. Go already. <laughs> With the war over, Jack's parents knew he'd soon be home, and they made preparations. They moved. So, <laughs> Jack decided on vaudeville as a career. It was about this time that many changes took place in the entertainment world. New innovations had come along, radio, talking pictures. And in one picture called Lucky Boy, a handsome young leading man named Georgie Jessel scored an immediate smash hit as he sang, <laughs> One bright and guiding light that taught me wrong from right I found in my mind. Georgie, eye. Georgie, look at this. Those nice... baby tales she told <laughs> that road old pay would go. Georgie, no... look at it's me. It's my life story. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. With the advent of radio... Many stars were made overnight, and one of the brightest was the man who always opened his show with... Hello again. From this, he became a star. <laughs> when Jack realized that he was a big hit on radio, he decided to get his own program, and first he looked for an announcer. He didn't have to look far, because Don Wilson was everywhere. <laughs> so Don Wilson was hired, even though at that time Jack was on for Jell-O. <laughs> Jack assembled his cash. He took Mary out of the stocking counter at the May Company. He reclaimed Phil Harris from a Bowery mission. <laughs> but he had a hard time getting Dennis paid. The organ grinder didn't want to part with him. <laughs> not content with his success in radio, Jack decided to go into motion pictures. And one night, he happened to be at a gay party where every big producer in Hollywood was present. And feeling that this was his opportunity, Jack approached Mr. Warner, the head of the Warner Brothers studio. Mr. Warner, I realize it's not considered proper to mix business with pleasure, but there's no reason why I can't be a big success in the movies. And I feel that if you and I put our heads together, we can come up with a role that will not only suit my particular talents, but will also... Never mind, just park my car. <laughs> Yes, sir. So Jack parked Mr. Warner's Cadillac, but he persisted and finally made a number of pictures for Warner Brothers. Climax by the horn blows at midnight. It was exactly one month after this picture was released that Jack met Mr. Warner at another party. But, Mr. Warner, there's no sense being mad at me. When you're a producer, you've got to take chances. And I feel that if you and I... Never mind, just park my Chevrolet. <laughs> But although he ruined others, Jack continued to do well. <laughs> and so he decided to move into a new house in Beverly Hills with his faithful valet, Rochester. Boss, this house is sure beautiful. Yes, it is, Rochester, but you know, I've been thinking. About what? Well, a house isn't really a home without a woman. Want me to get married? <laughs> Never mind. And so Jack moved into the home which he still resides at. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us up to the present. And old Jack Benny has won the respect of his colleagues, the acclaim of the public, and every award that he could possibly achieve. He's still the same man that he was when he started out. And knowing Jack as well as I do, 
I know that his greatest thrill came one day three years ago in a simple little presentation that the public doesn't even know about. And so, Mr. Benny, from our government in Washington, it's my pleasure to give you this. Gee, a $37 tax refund. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, on this happy note, we end our story. Well, Jack, that's it. Georgie, I think you did a wonderful job in presenting my life story, and I want to thank you. Well, Jack, you deserve it. Thanks, Georgie. And tonight, maybe the two of us. You deserve it because you've always had an abundance of those three great qualities, faith, hope, and charity. Georgie, don't get started again. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have but your Georgie, don't start again, For the next 30 minutes. Look, Georgie, I I don't want speeches. The half hour is nearly over now. We must get down to fundamentals. Georgie, please. Or the ebb and the flow of man's existence. Georgie, don't spoil everything. You did my life. That the substance of all of which, nothing else, the rest of But Georgie, is look at Georgie, this was my life. You're spoiling the whole so thing. Oh, talk. for heaven's sake. Let me talk. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, this is Mabel. Gertrude, how are you? I got another letter from Sylvester from overseas. And is he happy? Why? He says in his letter he's been pushed upstairs. Yeah. Now he's got at least 35 guys working under him and looking up to him. What? When did he get his promotion? What second, Lieutenant? What are you talking about, Gertrude? I know he got pushed upstairs. He was on the first floor of the barracks, and now he's on the second floor. <laughs> he's still a PFC. But don't worry. As soon as he passes his USAFI courses, it won't be no time before he's a second Louie. Or if he decides he wants to go into some kind of business instead, all he has to do is write USAFI in Madison 3, Wisconsin, and they'll send a report wherever Sylvester wants it sent. Oh, this Sylvester. He knows a good thing when he sees it. Then how come he glommed on to me? I was talking about you, Safi. <laughs> As for resenting that crack, let me tell you something. Oh, it looks like it'll have to wait, Gertrude. My buzz is flashing, so I'll have to disconnect you. I'll let you know when I hear from Sylvester again. Yeah. Don't take any wooden nickels. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, the chief hope of our enemies is to divide the United States along racial and religious lines and thereby conquer us. Let's not spread prejudice. A divided America is a weak America. Through our behavior, we encourage the respect of our children and make them better neighbors to all races and religions. Remind them that being good neighbors has helped make our country great and kept her free. Thank you. Jack Benny program is written by Sam Perrin, Milt Josephsburg, George Balter, and John Tackerberry, and produced and transcribed by Hilliard Marks. As usual, Jack Benny and all the gang will be back next week at this same time. See you then. Good night. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.